verse 6. And the close relative said, I cannot redeem it for myself, lest I ruin my own inheritance. With only a few exceptions, and I'm one of them, with only a few exceptions, scholars are in agreement that the Goel claimed he could not redeem the land because it would involve increasing his expenses during his life to care for Ruth and probably Naomi. This then would involve unnecessarily dividing his inheritance with Ruth's firstborn, who would bear the name of Malone's family line. In essence, as Ellicott explains, it would therefore be like mortgaging one's own estate, and that for the benefit of another. However, this is not the case, okay? It is an incorrect analysis of the situation. In Deuteronomy chapter 25, the perpetuation of the name has nothing to do with the inheritance of the land and the one raised up. All it says is this, it shall be that the firstborn son which she bears will succeed to the name of his dead brother, that his name may not be blotted out of Israel. Nothing within the law required him to ruin his land or his monetary inheritance. It merely required that he perform this one duty of having a child through the widow so that the name of his dead brother would live. Rather than this faulty assumption, it is her state as a Moabitess which he's concerned about. This is why Boaz specifically brought up her nationality in the previous verse. That's what's going on here. Elimelech, Malone, and Kilion all died in Moab, and he's concerned about the same thing happening to himself and his family right now. It is a repetition, and it is an exact repetition of what's already occurred many generations earlier in this same family line when Judah perceived the same thing in his daughter Tamar. So I want to read this to you. Then Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord killed him. And Judah said to Onan, Go into your brother's wife and marry her, and raise up an heir to your dead brother, to your brother. But Onan knew that the heir would not be his. And it came to pass, when he went into his brother's wife, that he omitted on the ground, lest he should give an heir to his brother. And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore the Lord killed him also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, Remain a widow in your father's house till my son Shelah is grown. For he said, Lest also he die like his brothers. And Tamar went and dwelt in her father's house. Mm. This is the ruin that he's concerned about. Instead of the grace which is found in the law, which included even this Gentile convert, he was overwhelmed with superstition of what acquiring Ruth might mean. However, Boaz was not. He understood that the law included the Gentiles in the rejoicing over God's gracious provision. As it says, right in the law of Moses itself, this is in Deuteronomy 32, rejoice, O Gentiles, with his people. Paul uses that very verse and he ascribes it to the work of Jesus Christ in Romans verse 15, 10. And this leads to one of the reasons why Judah and Tamar are mentioned later in this chapter in a positive light. Verse six continues, you redeem my Excuse me, you redeem my right of redemption for yourself. Boaz is granted the right of redemption and all that accompanies it. And thus he is also granted Ruth, the Moabitess's wife. The heavy, difficult beatings of his heart over the anxiety of the moment surely turned to heavy beatings of his heart over joy and anticipation in securing the desire of that excited heart. To him would come this beautiful friend, this lovely Gentile and this woman of virtue who had stolen his heart from the moment he saw her there gleaning in the fields. Boaz has prevailed. 